so let's be not kidding here. I've been a student forever. Forget the 12 years I've spent on my doctorate. I'm going on 30 if you include preschool. Nobody wants to be that guy living in a void of academia. I would often be told that as long as I'm not here for as much time as so-and-so, I would be OK. But nobody has too many words of encouragement when I became so-and-so. <laughs> Perhaps unbelievably, I'm not salty about it. Not anymore. You know, I've always wanted to be a scientist. Perhaps because my parents ran the best sociological experiment in the history of the world by raising two precocious little Hindu kiddos down in Clinton, Mississippi. <laughs> in fact, it was done so well that my cousins in India would often make fun of me for being too Indian. At the beginning of my academic career in 1984 at First Baptist Preschool, we all used to stand in the foyer and wait for our parents to pick us up. Instead of walking inside, they would write our names on paper grocery bags in big lettering and display it prominently in their windshields. So this is truly the earliest form of text messaging. <laughs> My preschool teacher, Ms. Bailey, saw me standing there, waiting patiently, looking out the window, and she asked me if that was my mom waiting outside in the brown station wagon. I had clearly misread the sign and thought the R was a V. So I told her that that person had written P-A-V-A-G, which spelled Pavag. I'm not Pavag, I'm Parag. <laughs> so clearly, the empirical evidence does not support the conclusion that you're drawing. <laughs> of course, I communicated this mostly in tears, not in words. But I was eventually convinced that she was, in fact, my mom. <laughs> Ever since then, though, I've always thought there was a 0.001% chance that I was living the life of Pavad. And though that question lingered, I did really well in high school. And I went on to Vanderbilt University with pit stops at the NASA Academy at Dryden, now Armstrong, Flight Research Center, and Lehman Brothers, now defunct, <laughs> in New York. About the second one, my mom wasn't too happy. She told me, you're like a piece of paper. New York will tear you up and throw you away, mom. <laughs> but there was a lot of structure in my life at that time, and I excelled in it. From the age of 15 until I was 22, I translated that structure into what is written on these actual pieces of paper, my CV. I made it perfect, and I filled it in quickly and fully so I could get to the next step in life, whatever that was. After reading this document, no one would ever throw it away, right? The tragedy was that I wasn't really learning to educate myself, but instead to show people what I had done. And that was a really bad idea. I only realized this in graduate school at Northwestern University. Graduate school, where the hopes and dreams of the young and naive come to die a very slow death. <laughs> but only if you let them. I've determined that there are three different types of graduate students. Those that come and tear it up. They do exceptionally well in their research. Those who come and tear things up, they break, break equipment and computer programs. And those who come and tear themselves up because they're miserable all the time. Everyone always wants to be in the first group, but I was definitely in a combination of the second two. Because regardless of what those beautiful pieces of paper said, my CV, I wasn't prepared to study at this level. I was on a National Science Foundation fellowship to study computational mechanical engineering, basically theory and simulations. But simply put, I didn't know what I was doing. But in my third year, I figured it out. Everything finally started to come into place, and I developed a new research topic from first principles and published literature, something that's not very easy. And things were looking up. But I also found myself in a quandary due to this odd path that I had chosen. And that was, if I wanted to study experimental mechanical engineering, using my hands to develop theory and confirm my hypotheses, I had to resign my fellowship, which is basically unheard of, find someone to oversee my work, which is extremely difficult, and obtain research funding to do so, which is effectively impossible. 
It was at this time that I realized I didn't know anything about anything. But I found an advisor and got a guest appointment at Argonne National Lab for additional access to equipment and another brilliant set of minds. And things were really looking fantastic. I was left with one big, big problem, however. And that was that I was broke on top of broke. Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson is one of the foremost science advocates in our country at the, at the moment. He's the director of the Hayden Planetarium in New York and the current host of Cosmos, a series that's a recreation of that by the same name by Dr. Carl Sagan. I respect him greatly because he's a humanist who happens to communicate through a platform of science. The story goes that during his PhD, he also faced funding difficulties. And in order to address that, he thought he would do male stripping in order to make money. <laughs> now, clearly, I wouldn't do all that well in this profession. <laughs> Small, balding Indian boys from Mississippi <laughs> that weigh a buck 28 soaking wet are not the desired demographic they're looking for in this field of employment. <laughs> but in accordance with everything else, and all the bad decisions that I had made up to that point in my life, I decided to do something even more stupid. I thought I could take advantage of my knowledge of game theory, my mathematical aptitude, and my ability to read people to become the best poker player that's ever lived, <laughs> even better than the godfather of poker himself, Mr. Doyle Brunson. Ladies and gentlemen, let me just tell you, it takes a special type of doofus to come up with this idea. <laughs> I'm not special, I'm just some guy. Uh, the tragedy was that I didn't realize exactly how to go about this. But in, in my mind, I deluded myself into thinking that in Pavag's fantasy world, I would be special. And so I ran poker like a business creating spreadsheets and running statistics. I even had my own nickname picked out, the Mississippi Kid. <laughs> to this day, no one's ever called me by that name. <laughs> to play the game, they say all you need is a chip and a chair. I don't know the mentally deranged optimist that originated that phrase, but neither he nor anyone else was around. But I not only lost that chip, but also the chair itself. Even though I thought I knew what I was doing, I couldn't beat the variance. And so this joke of a venture ended as quickly as it started with a very tough phone call to my father. Papa? Yes? <laughs> I think I've been doing something pretty moronic. Well, let's hear it. Again, I had a conversation that was communicated mostly in tears, not in words. But he heard me out through all of my shame, regret, sense of desperation and loneliness about this and everything else that I thought was so wrong in my life. He asked me if I would ever let my own kids run this type of idiotic business. And I said, definitely not. To which he replied, why then would you think I would be OK letting mine? Hmm. He added, silly boy, you're never alone. You always have me and all of the people around you for support. Ten years from now, if nothing else, I hope you understand the importance of the multitude of people upon whose shoulders you have stood. Never be scared to ask for help. Wow. He ended the call by saying, I'm glad you're at one piece, but stay where you are, because I'm coming to Evanston to break you into multiple ones. <laughs> Dads, as fathers tend to annoyingly be, he was right. Thankfully, not about breaking me into multiple pieces, but about having people around me for support. Oh, you've got a debilitating back condition and other health complications? We can accommodate you. You want more structure so you don't feel like you're repeating the same year of your life over and over again? We've got offices for that. You have a good reason for needing extra time because of experimental complications and funding issues? We've got you, bro. It's the people. The people of this university, whether they be faculty, staff, students, or administrators, all help make up the wonderful and magnificent neighborhood that Mr. Fred Rogers always told us was so valuable when we joined in this television world. 
Sometimes we are subtly taught that we should respect those whose shoes make sounds that echo through the halls even if they carry no substance. Mr. Rogers is the exact opposite of those types of people. And he deserves our greatest respect for teaching us how to live beyond ourselves in service of others. How elated Mr. Rogers must be as he looks down at us from the far reaches of the cosmos to see us all here together today as one. If I were to follow anyone's path in life, it would be him. He reached out to hug his community. Many people here reached out to hug me, and I wanted to hug back. I got on stage as the only graduate student member of an undergraduate a cappella group. I was terrible. <laughs> but we all sang with affection. I helped encourage the next generation of scholars at an academic science bowl and asked them what they wondered about science. I was amazed with their curiosity and their passion. I got out there and gave away water during our spring festival known as Armadillo Day. I saw a lot of our students join me in doing so, a very poignant display of community affection. Kudos to all of these young scholars, because in these endeavors, I realized we were supporting part of the university's mission, which is to support the growth of our whole by addressing the growth of our individuals. The other part of that mission is equally powerful, and that is to serve as a foundation for intellectual truth one that is developed honestly but is not immune to discourse, and to use such truth to educate the next generation of scholars. I was recently invited to attend the ARPA-E's Energy Innovation Summit in Washington, DC. This is the new branch for advanced innovation in the Department of Energy. Its director, Dr. Cheryl Martin, asks the big picture about potential projects that they are about to fund. If it works, will it matter? It's a magnificent question and one that we must keep at the forefront of our minds as we do our own investigations into fundamental science. But how wonderful it is to know that at an academic institution, the first question and the most important one is, if it works, can you tell me why? Trust me, we do an exceptionally great job of that here. How then could I possibly be salty if the answer to that for myself is not complete? I say all of these things to you here today because it's important to reinforce what truly matters at a university, its mission and the people that uphold it. I also have a responsibility to remind you that you are never alone. All of the problems we face individually are not easy and neither are they simple, even if they appear that way. I mean, even the proof of one plus one equals two takes 378 pages in Principia Mathematica. But nothing stops us from changing the way we look at things. By doing that, we can, as the author, Mr. Robert Fulgham states, understand how to separate our true problems in life from our inconveniences. I continue to have many, many inconveniences, but almost no problem. I also continue to be wrong about many, many things on a daily basis. In fact, I'm sure I hold the world record for the phrase, sorry, professor. <laughs> but that's not always bad, because that's why we're here, to learn for the sake of learning, to ultimately win by perhaps having lost or having been lost. So when I hear people discussing the merits of a university education in our modern day, I only have to tell them a little bit about myself to prove its value. We are not here to create robots with perfect CVs. Universities exist to make sure that our fabricated pavads don't prevail over our inquisitive parades. And here's the quick kicker. I can't promise you that I'll leave this institution with a PhD. I can't. I mean, I'll be really, really sad about it if I don't. But what I can say is that on that last day, I will leave here with my head held up extremely high, with many, many tears in my eyes, and with the biggest smile on my face, knowing that all I've been able to accomplish, acquire, and contribute here was not because of me, but because of all of you, those with whom I've been so privileged to cross paths. All of you have become a part of my family, 
helped me make this my home, and pushed me to find me. I will cherish these truths forever, and of that, upon all of my strengths and all of my faults, with all of my affection, respect, integrity, and most of all, gratitude, you have my word of honor.